even though the United States has largely moved away from belching smoke stacks and unfettered vehicle emissions, air quality is a significant problem for more than 126 million Americans. The Clean Air Act of 1970 was the first end of pipe regulation passed to control air quality and air pollution, and it has been amended since its passage. The Clean Air Act and the Clean Air Act amendments are the primary focus for this chapter. The learning outcomes for this chapter are Identify the major regulated air pollutants and recognize the sources and effects, human health and environmental, associated with each. Explore major air quality problems and history of the regulatory approaches taken to date. Recognize and explain the components of the Clean Air Act. Comprehend the evolution of the regulatory approach to air quality. Evaluate the effectiveness of air quality regulations. Six major pollutants were targeted the 1970 Clean Air Act. This group of pollutants was called the criteria pollutants. The term, criteria pollutants, derives from the National Ambient Air Quality Standards requirement that EPA must describe the characteristics and potential health and welfare effects of these pollutants. Sulfur dioxide, or SO2, is a corrosive gas. Natural sources of sulfur dioxide include volcanic eruptions decay of organic matter and ocean sea spray. More than half of sulfur dioxide emissions are derived from human activities especially combustion of fossil fuels for transportation, prior to catalytic converters and electricity generation. Respiratory damage and acid rain are two problems associated with sulfur dioxide. Nitric oxide and nitrogen dioxide are gases that contribute to acid rain, smog, climate change, and water deterioration and cause respiratory damage. Natural sources include lightning strikes and organic decay. At least half of the annual emissions are from human activities from motor vehicles, power plants, industrial emissions, waste disposal, residential wood combustion, fertilizers, and livestock. Carbon monoxide CO, is a poisonous gas that leads to mental impairment, angina, impaired senses, and also accumulation of ozone, and it behaves as a greenhouse gas. Carbon monoxide results mostly from natural processes, but humans contribute a large amount mostly via incomplete fuel combustion and motor vehicle exhaust. Other man-made sources include non-road vehicles and construction equipment, wood stoves, incinerators, and industrial processes. Tropospheric ozone is formed when nitrogen oxides and volatile organic compounds, VOCs, react in the presence of sunlight. Ozone is the main component of smog. Since ozone is the byproduct of pollutants combining, the strategy for decreasing ozone is usually targeting nitrogen oxides. Ozone has distinct effects on human health, which include eye irritation, nasal congestion, asthma, reduced lung function, possible damage to lung tissue, reduced resistance to infection. Ozone also influences ecosystems negatively. Ozone impacts plants causing damage to plant tissues, inhibition of photosynthesis, and increased susceptibility to plant disease and drought. Particulates are solids and liquids that are suspended in the air, ranging in size from fine, smaller than 2.5 micrometers to coarse, 2.5 to 10 micrometers. Gas transformation in the atmosphere and soil erosion form some particulates. But industrial development, combustion, and other dusty human activities increase the amount of particulates to a large degree. Negative health effects are amplified when particle size decreases. Lighter particles travel farther both in the atmosphere and in our bodies. Most concerns are related to respiratory damage and visibility. However, it is important to note that in the last decade there has been increased recognition of a direct link between PM exposure and heart attacks. One plausible hypothesis is that the smallest particles are able to pass into the blood. These particles then act to encourage an increase in the formation of plaques. Lead was added as a criteria pollutant in 1976, after the National Resources Defense Council won a Supreme Court case wherein they required the EPA to regulate lead given the requirements of the Clean Air Act and the known health effects of lead, NRDCV, train. In the 1920s, a fuel additive, tetraethyl lead, was developed to boost the octane of gasoline and allow engines to run more smoothly. Prior to the implementation of the catalytic converter in cars in the mid-1970s, leaded gasoline was standard. Since catalytic converters did not work well with leaded gasoline, unleaded gas became the major product. Lead emissions can also come from coal combustion, smelters, car battery plants, 
and the combustion of garbage that contains lead. Lead can also be present in indoor environments with dust from old paint. The health impacts of lead are severe and permanent and especially potent for children. Lead can hinder mental development and performance, it can adversely affect kidney function and blood chemistry. Children are the most susceptible since they are more likely to ingest lead contaminated soils and dust and young tissues are also more sensitive to lead. Acid deposition is created when sulfur dioxide or nitrogen oxides react with sunlight and water vapor to form acids, which fall to the earth as deposition. Wet deposition may be snow or rain, and dry deposition may be in the form of dust or gases. Acid rain usually has a pH below 5, and it affects the eastern U.S. in particular due to higher levels of industrial combustion. The amount of deposition and sensitivity of the recipient land determine the amount of damage caused. Areas farther to the northeast with granite or glacial soils cannot buffer the greater amounts of acid deposition that spread that direction through the atmosphere. Acid deposition causes soil leaching, increased erosion, harm to aquatic ecosystems, building degradation, and public health issues. Depletion of the stratospheric ozone layer is problematic because it reduces our protection from solar radiation. Development of a hole in the ozone layer located above Antarctica has been tracked since the 1970s. This hole was primarily created by chlorofluorocarbons, or CFCs, which are compounds that persist in the atmosphere and break down ozone, O3, into oxygen, O2. The other depleting compounds are halons, found in fire extinguishing foams. The 1987 United Nations UN Montreal Protocol aims to decrease ozone-depleting compounds and allow ozone layer recovery by about 2050. Greenhouse gases, GHGs, are those that exist in an outer layer of our atmosphere. They let visible light from the sun pass through, and when energy is radiated off of Earth's surface, some of it escapes into a space but greenhouse gases reflect and retain some of the energy as heat. This process, called the greenhouse effect, is essential for life on Earth because it allows the surface to be warm enough. However, release of more greenhouse gases leads to more warming, which has uncertain consequences. Some of these gases are carbon dioxide, CO2, methane, CH4, nitrous oxide, NO2, and fluorinated gases. Increased emissions of greenhouse gases since the Industrial Revolution is strongly correlated with temperature increases. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC, is an international group of scientists commissioned by the UN. The IPCC assesses the scientific, technical and socio-economic information relevant for the understanding of the risk of human-induced climate change. The IPCC has issued five assessment reports from 1990 to 2014. Sea levels could rise due to warm water expansion and the melting of ice at the planet's poles, an especially important issue for island and coastal inhabitants. Vegetation growth appears to have already responded to changing climate zones. Precipitation and temperature effects on agriculture have the potential to affect our ability to feed a growing world population. Additionally, the spread of certain diseases may intensify and expand Wrangell to new regions depending on vectors and pathogens affected by climate change. Global warming is still perhaps one of the most controversial international issues today. Although most countries admit that global warming is occurring, nations frequently disagree about what to do to ameliorate the situation. The Kyoto Protocol was an attempt by the global community to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by the year 2012 by an average of 5.2 percent below 1990 levels, and consequently reverse the trend of warming. However, the enforcement of the treaty depended on the ratification of many developed countries, including the United States and Russia. In March 2001, President Bush took a major step toward encouraging the demise of the Kyoto Protocol by going back on his campaign pledge and saying that the United States was not going to be a party to the Kyoto Protocol. By pulling out of the negotiations over the treaty, the United States made it extremely difficult for the treaty to become effective because the protocol had to be ratified by 55 industrial nations responsible for at least 55% of carbon dioxide emissions. The United States accounts for 35% of global emissions. In 2004, Russia provided the key signature to the treaty. The Kyoto Protocol went into effect in February 2006. As of 2010, 184 countries have ratified the treaty, representing nearly 62% of global emissions covered in the treaty. The nine years between the drafting of the treaty and its going into effect illustrates the difficulty of forging international environmental treaties.
In part, the Kyoto Protocol's slow ratification process is due to the tragedy of the commons or the free rider problem. All countries will benefit from the reduction of carbon dioxide emissions, yet if some countries, including the United States, are unwilling to cooperate, all may suffer in the end. Indoor air pollution occurs when airborne toxins, irritants, and other air pollutants become trapped inside buildings because of inadequate ventilation throughout the building. The EPA estimates that as many as 30% of new and remodeled buildings have indoor air quality problems. Poorly ventilated buildings trap airborne pathogens, such as bacteria, fungi, and viruses, radioactive gases, such as radon, a wide range of inorganic compounds, such as lead and mercury, and organic compounds, such as formaldehyde and chloroform. Many of these harmful pollutants are caused by indoor smoking, the use of wood stoves and space heaters, chemicals on furniture finishings, and the use of cleaning solvents, wood finishing products, and air fresheners. In the short run, these pollutants can cause sick building syndrome, which is associated with runny noses, headaches, eye, nose, and throat irritations, fatigue, lethargy, irritableness, dizziness, and nausea. In the long run, they may lead to impairment of the nerve system and cancer. Indoor pollutants are a special problem for the old and young, who spend more than an average amount of time indoors. The average person in the United States still spends 90% of his or her time indoors, consequently exposing himself or herself to indoor pollutants.